I'm Dr. Mark Moyad, section editor at Grand Rounds and Urology, section editor in the sort of the lifestyle preventive alternative area. And so I like to think it's a big umbrella, a big pizza pie, and we also cover men's health. And I'm not going to cover men's health unless I also get to talk to one of the gurus of men's health, which is also a very good friend of mine. I know a lot of people say that when they do interviews. He's a really good friend of mine, but he actually is a really good friend of mine. We actually talk off camera all the time. That's Marty Miner. And I know you've done a million things, Marty, but I think one of the most interesting is your founder. You're one of the first legitimate uh, founders and creators of the men's health, uh, a men's health center. That, that's at Miriam Hospital. And you're a clinical professor in family medicine and urology uh, with the Warren Alport. I'm trying to, I think I had this memorized, School of Medicine at Brown University, Providence, Rhode Island. And you've been there a long time, correct? And if I, it, I, I missed anything, let me know because- No, you're, oh. you're there, you're there. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we founded the center in 2006 and it was at the time, it was the first uh, men's health center in an academic institution. Um, I found it with the chief of urology and a psychologist who was um, a very much a guru in men's health, John Wentz. Wow. So if I was, even though we're going to talk about uh, BMI and testosterone in your recent presentation and what that means, um, I, I should probably ask you if you had, if you had one or two sentences each, What's the greatest? What's the greatest pros of being a, a starting a men's health center in the United States? A legitimate men's health center. I can't emphasize that enough. And what's what's the greatest con that you've run into, or disadvantage that surprised you? Do you have a quick answer to the biggest well, benefit and the biggest drawback that might have well, surprised Well, the biggest. You? I always feared that if if you build it, it's like um, Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. <laughs> if you build it, will they come? And um, the biggest pro is that it's really, really busy and we've never advertised. You know, on, in Rhode Island and in Providence, we have buses with the Women's Health Collaborative Center all over it. And there's never been one advertisement other than one ad in the paper when we first opened that said, with a man who was looking at a map for directions and said, if you need help, reading a map come to the men's health centers <laughs> well, the only reason I, say about sexual function the only reason i ask you that is for, for the audience watching today i get inundated by calls all the time which i can't answer and this is a really good one this is like a sneak bonus of this feature is they always say you know it, starting a men's health center in my part of the country is probably too hard i don't want to do that is it, is it really too difficult or is it, is it not that hard and we just make a big deal out of it? It's, you know, you, you have to go through and get all the approvals from the Dean of the medical school and all the departments. And at first, all of the Department of Internal Medicine thought I was just a urologist who wanted to start men on statins, so they couldn't figure it out. <laughs> so they were kind of upset about that. And then we kind of morphed into more of a lifestyle, um, you know, obesity, cardiometabolic um, health program. And yeah. it, it's been fun. That's it's awesome. Been, I, mean, I mean, I really been, appreciate that because people are always asking, how can I start it? And so for those of you who are watching this tape, this is a quick advertisement. If you're thinking about starting a men's health center, a legitimate men's health center somewhere in the U.S. or outside of the U.S., please contact Marty Miner at Brown University. His contact information is a part of most of his talks and most of his interviews. So I'm sorry I offered you up on a plate like that. I That's hope. okay. Okay. So I, here's the segment. What makes me a little bit wacky, Marty, Marty M. Miner. I should ask, what's the M stand for in your middle name? It's Morris. It's like the car oh, Morris. out okay. of England. Okay, so Marty Miner, this is what makes me a little bit uh, wacky, is that we love to talk about testosterone. We love to talk about esoteric things, numbers, parameters, data, but sometimes we don't get simplistic enough when it comes to my area and lifestyle. You recently presented a paper that essentially, now I'll let you talk about it, suggested that as BMI goes up, 
the testosterone needs might also go up. So can you explain that? And, and to me, it's such a wonderful, simple study with the, such an important message that just doesn't get enough attention. So can you give that attention right now as to what you presented? Of course, um, this is a, um, a product, Zyastad, which is testosterone enanthate, which comes in three formulations, 50 milligrams weekly, 75 milligrams weekly, and 100 milligrams weekly. And the 75 milligrams is supposed to be the one size fits all. And I was curious because in my experience, obese men or men with BMIs greater than 30 seem to require larger dosing of testosterone to achieve um, eugonadal levels upon repletion. And we all know that obesity is associated with low levels of testosterone. We all know that, um, um, that low testosterone is associated with um, that the prevalence of, of, of testosterone deficiency is greater in obese men, but nobody's ever really studied the pharmacokinetics of testosterone in, in normal size men and men who are larger. So we did a post hoc analysis of their phase three data, looking at um, about 400 men over a period of about a year and a half. And we looked at just the, the CMAX, the, all of the pharmacokinetic data. And we found that men who were obese did indeed require higher um, doses of testosterone to achieve eugonadal levels. Right. That those men who were obese who were given the same dose as those men who were a normal size, um, they had lower PK data um, that on, in all domains, whether it's trough, whether it's Cmax, whether it's um, you know whether it's the average level, and um, it was just a very simple but interesting study because it hadn't been done before. <laughs> no yeah. one really thinks about it. No one thinks about individualizing testosterone levels. I mean, we're all looking at symptoms, but um, what in my experience, we were very fearful about giving too much, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so no one's gonna start at a, perhaps a larger dose to achieve efficacy. So, when, so if higher BMI requires higher dose, yeah. To, achieve, to achieve similar numbers. Are you confident then you would see similar clinical tangibility for the things that people are looking for when they get replacement? I mean, I know, so, so it, it, would be, it would be intuitive, right? To think that they, to get them to a similar number, they need a higher dose, but you're feeling pretty strongly that that also is gonna be associated with beneficial outcomes too? I do, I do. And we're gonna see that with, um, with the, with the long-term safety study, which is gonna look at more efficacy. And that's to be published, I think in October of 22. But we're gonna hopefully see that with long-term safety. And if we see that indeed testosterone therapy is safe, then we can really focus on symptomatic benefit, including mood and, um, and potentially reduction of cardiovascular risk. That's always been the key. Mm -hmm. If low T is associated with a greater incidence of major adverse cardiovascular events, then if you replete it, do you reduce that risk? Well, that's something that we're gonna find out in the Traverse study that's ongoing. And if that's the case, um, and if then I think we're gonna be able to achieve more efficacy if we consider a person's BMI. And that includes potentially reduction of their weight, reduction, improvement of muscle mass, lessening of sarcopenia, reduction of osteopenia, um, and, and aging better and healthier. Do you see people that go on replacement 
they get those things and then you can take them off replacement? Well, younger men who, that's a, that's a very good question. I, because let me, that, tell, let me tell you what, I'm, let me tell you, I, I, you know, as you know, I don't deal with the, the testosterone replacement. It's not, it's, it's not my, it's not my wheelhouse, my wheel, but right. my wheelhouse is if I thought of a glass is half full for my area of testosterone, if somebody got a really good response and they were getting lean muscle mass and they were becoming more fit and they were dropping pounds, I would think that the Nirvana goal would be they reach a point where maybe they get a big kick of testosterone back and ultimately they'll need lower doses of TRT or no doses. Am I just right. thinking, is that- well, So th there are, no, no, that's an absolute. So in my experience, testosterone deficiency occurs in middle-aged men. Um, and this is um, adult onset um, hypogonadism. Yes. Middle-aged men, which is not what testosterone de is approved for by the FDA, but middle-aged men who've gone through major stressors in their lives. They've gotten divorced. They're having great financial difficulties. They've, this is perhaps um, tangential to or concomitant with the development of comorbid disease states. Once they develop those comorbidities, which are often associated with obesity, which include hypertension, dyslipidemia, glucose intolerance and or type two diabetes, they tend to be on that path to developing testosterone deficiency. Mm. If they lose that weight over a period of time and they reverse those comorbidities, the truth is that I think you can give them a trial off testosterone therapy and or give them some HCG to help resume their own production of testosterone. If they're not able to reverse those comorbidities, then I yeah. feel that, and they're older, above the age of 60, then I think it's much more difficult to get them to be able to restart making testosterone to the levels yeah. that they actually need. That's really interesting. So now if I take your study with the drug, and even if in my world of supplements, I'm just going to put those on the shelf for now. Just I'm going to shelf that. And the last part of this is yeah. It's going to be one of my famous signs. Are we not emphasizing this enough, though, throughout medicine? As your BMI we, goes down, in a lot of, I'm not saying for everybody, and you know it's not for everybody, but there is a strong minority, or maybe it's a majority of men, as your BMI goes down, whether it's through diet, exercise, you name it, testosterone can significantly go up. Do you agree or disagree? Oh, I agree completely. That's, that is key. That is vital. And that is from age 35 on. I mean, that's every man that you see. So if you can stress to them the, the greatest driver of lower testosterone levels as we age is not that the testes, you know, aren't are petering out because of age. It's pe they're petering out because of your obesity mm. and your lack of exercise and lifestyle issues and the stressors of living um, as a middle-aged, you know, mildly to morbidly obese male with the concomitant comorbidities with hypertension and type two diabetes. Every man you see who has metabolic syndrome is going or driving their testosterone down. If a BMI goes down, testosterone will go up. Thank you very much. That's the first time I've ever watched a video with this sign as well as someone saying that that sign makes sense in their clinical practice. So I want to leave you with the thought on this segment that in the men's health center that you have at Brown there that you started, you must have many, many wonderful success stories of people actually just losing some weight and getting a nice surge in testosterone and they were happy. And, and can I believe that? I've never talked to you about that topic, but do you, can, well, when you think in your mind, you have many examples of significant weight loss, and then they had a nice surge in testosterone, and you, and you saw that, and they felt it. Let's say it's happened. It's not, because I think one of the most difficult things for people to do is to lose weight and to keep that weight off. Right. And I think that obesity, and this is kind of getting into our second topic, obesity is not managed as a chronic disease state. 
Mm. Obesity is, is managed as a volitional or willful attempt by the patient to not lose weight because they're eating junk. And that may or may not be true. I mean, there are many factors that drive obesity and diet is certainly one of them. But a lot of this is, a lot of this is, seems metabolically genetic <laughs> and yeah. people lose 5% of their weight and perhaps their testosterone levels are going to go up, but then they regain that weight very often. So I see I see that and I understand that and I try not to, and I'm, I attempt to make this a judgment-free center where, yeah. you know, we're going to be cycling through periods together as with the patients um, where their weight's going to change. People's weight changed dramatically during COVID yeah. and is and ongoing. Um, yeah. But I'll tell you, as, as we leave this segment, and we'll talk about this in another segment, I'm glad you see it. I'm not saying we have the answer. I just as BMI goes up, testosterone goes down. And in my Absolutely. world, right, in my world, it's not just testosterone that goes down. You also see these biomarkers, other biomarkers that everyone gets so excited about taking pills for and doing things. As BMI goes up, vitamin D goes down. As BMI right. goes up, uh, HDL goes down. Good cholesterol. Right. Uh, Right. I just wish there was a lot more videos and I'm grateful for this segment from Grand Rounds that people understand that with weight gain comes drops in major markers and that alone doesn't get enough attention. So I appreciate right. bringing awareness to it today. Right. I mean, so, I, you see it all the time. People come in and they're off their blood pressure medicine. They're off their diabetic, their oral diabetic meds. And they're really pleased and they've, their self-esteem has improved their mood which we rarely talk about, is dramatically improved. Yeah, yeah. So I appreciate that. As we conclude this segment, we'll be back in just a moment with another segment. Thank you, Dr. Miner. I appreciate yeah. it.